But slowly but surely, people are coming around to that. I've done a quick and dirty study of what the U.S. government actually invests in intangible assets. Uh, in 2000, fiscal year 2008, it was uh, almost 44 percent of non-defense spending was investment by the federal government in intangible assets. Now, I'm not going to do um, uh, fiscal year 2009. I've got those numbers, but the problem is with the stimulus package, everything is distorted and you can't figure out what the, the, where the trend lines are. But the, the trends have been for greater spending in many of the intangible asset areas, even though the overall numbers have gone down in terms of percent. Uh, just real quickly, I know this is hard to read, slides will be available afterwards. The biggest part of the investment in intangible assets is in R&D and education. But there's all sorts of other things, such as the statistical services, export promotion, um, food safety, if you want to think about intangible assets in terms of reputation, the ability to know that your food doesn't have salmonella and is stamped by the U.S. government as saying so is an important intangible asset. Okay. Which brings us to the next part that's happening in the United States, especially in the federal government, which is that management of those intangible assets. Problem is, we are completely conflicted on this. We don't have any sort of in intellectual coherence into how we treat these assets. For example, we have the problem with who owns weather data? Who owns stock data? Depends. We have various information policies in the United States, but the answer to those questions is different depending on who got to the data first. Because there's a lot of private data providers out there that have a vested interest in taking government data and turning it into other things. So it's hard for the government to get a handle on that particular asset. Uh, the same is true with intellectual property from government-funded research. Um, we have a law called by dole uh, I was in the Senate when we, staff, when we helped put this through. Uh, it gives the patents to the universities or the individual researchers if it's government-funded. Well, the problem with that is it's given a lot of impetus to the universities to patent but not necessarily share their technology. So there's a, a movement now in the United States to look at to see whether we ought to rewrite by Dole in order to get more technology out and go back to the uh, mission of the universities of sharing technology rather than simply patenting it and holding it inside. Um, there was a very successful um, auction of government patents from NASA uh, done by Ocean Tomo this past year or so. So there's, there are areas where the government's trying to get these assets out, but the laws, again, are conflictatory. Um, the government owns particular brands. There is a law in place that protects these particular brands, Smokey the Bear, Woody Owl. I'm, I hope I'm not going to get in trouble for actually using the Smokey Bear emblem here without a license from the federal government. But there is a law in place that protects those particular brands. The FBI gets royalty from the words FBI. Uh, Scot New Scotland Yard has just done the same thing in the UK. So there are parts of the government that, again, are conflicted on this. FBI gets royalties, but don't try to license the presidential seal. In fact, Mr. Obama got in trouble back when he was a candidate for using something that looked like the presidential seal before he was actually president. Uh, you Smokey the Bear on your commercials, you're in real trouble. They won't even license it out. Um, here's another great one, airport landing rights. Standard definition going back to FASB said that licenses and airport things like mineral rights, airport landing rights are an asset. Well, according to the Government Accountability Office of the U.S. Congress, landing rights are not property. They cannot be auctioned off under the FAA's ability to sell surplus property. And there's a whole series of court cases that deal with that, that whether a government regulation is property or not property, whether a government regulation is a government asset or only becomes an asset when somebody else gets it. That puts a great 
barrier to U.S. trying to figure out what to do with these other intangible assets. The real issue here, though, was backdoor funding. Congress got very upset when FAA tried to auction off uh, landing rights because it gave them a revenue stream that Congress didn't control. So there's a whole other issue of what you do with these government assets once you have them. But that isn't stopping Congress from creating a whole new set of assets, literally out of thin air, called the cap and trade system for CO2. The problem is we're going forward with a massive bill in the Congress right now to create a new asset, these trading rights and CO2. We're not certain how we're going to deal with them once they get out there. We have regulatory agencies in place, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, remember them, remember their great regulation of Enron. We have the Commodity Futures Exchange Commission, remember their great regulation of derivatives. So we've got a couple of regulatory agencies that don't have stellar records in dealing with these intangible assets. Then there's the whole issue of the accountants haven't got a clue as to how to deal with these things. Both FASB and IASB had rules out. ISB actually had a draft rule out where they were going to try to figure out how to deal with, um, with accounting for these particular, uh, these particular assets. They pulled it back because the companies objected. Um, it was called IFRIS number three for admission rights. No work is being done. They say, well, we're studying the issue. We've had cap and trade assets before, but nothing at the volume that we're about to have once the United States government creates its cap and trade system. So the financial system is about to be hit with a tsunami of these new intangible assets that it hasn't got a clue how to regulate or deal with. That's going to create a huge backlash, I think, on the use of intangible assets, but also a great opportunity for dealing with some of these problems. The U.S. government's trying to deal with taxes on intangibles right now. There's new proposals in place that will actually expand the definition of intangibles to be looked at in transfer taxing um, policies to workforce in place. So all of a sudden, the tax agencies are going to realize or going to put their stamp of an approval on workforce in place as an intangible asset. What will that do to everybody's accounting systems? Patent reform is ongoing in the United States. The courts have taken the initiative on a lot of stuff, but patent reform is still stalled in the United States Congress, mostly on the issues of IT versus biotech pharma. At the same time, we have a whole new set of other patent issues coming up. Gene patents, business process patents, tax strategies, all of which are, have either active court cases or legislation pending as we speak. How will those change how we deal with intangible assets in the United States? Finally, there's the whole area of financing that was touched on before. Uh, we're beginning to look at that in the United States in a little more detail. The problem is, up until now, financing of intangible assets has been through a process called securitization. Well, securitization right now in the United States is a dirty word. It's what's caused, supposedly caused the meltdown. So there's not a lot of people talking about securitization of intangible assets. However, there is work being done on both intangible asset-backed lending and on equity investments in intangible assets, especially in the biotech area. We're buying up patent pools and then licensing them out. 